Hello and welcome to Big Picture Monday. My name is Callie Black here with all the context you need to totally rock this week's Come Follow Me readings. This week we are studying the Epistle of James. There's five chapters in James. We're studying all five chapters and that is it. This week marks a big turning point because we are not studying anything to do with Paul. We said goodbye to him last week. Um, but we are now on to a new section of epistles called the general epistles. And what general epistles are is that they are epistles written by certain church leaders and the audience is for everyone as a church. Think of this in contrast to how Paul wrote a lot of his letters, which were for the Corinthians, for the Ephesians, right? Like he has a specific location or even like for Timothy, for Titus, where it's a specific uh, individual that's going to receive that. So if you think first Timothy, Timothy didn't write that, Paul wrote it to Timothy. But now we're in James, this is James writing the epistle, and that's how it's going to be from here on out with the epistles. With these general epistles, it means that the person's name, who's the title of the book, is the one who wrote it, and the audience is just everyone. They are still epistles, so they're still letters, but they were meant to be distributed throughout all of the church. So, as you can probably guess, as we get to these general epistles, they are arranged in not chronological order, of course not that. In length order, you're right if you said that. Length order, so James is the shortest general epistle, so that's where we're starting with his, and then we'll go on to um, first and second Peter, and then we have first, second, and third John, and then the book of Jude. So we go in that order, and then we'll be done with the epistles. But here we are. Who was James? Who was James? First of all, it is not Peter, James, and John, that James, not that James, okay? Not him. This is the half-brother of Jesus, meaning James is a literal child of Mary and Joseph, and so that would make him a half-brother to Jesus. Now, we know very, very little about Jesus's immediate family. Um, however, there are some clues, and so the best kind of story we can come up with for James's life is he probably did not believe Jesus and was not a follower of Jesus while Jesus was on the earth during his mortal ministry. Um, we have lots of clues that Jesus's siblings did not uh, follow him. However, after Jesus' death and resurrection and coming back to minister for a little while longer and then leaving, James was converted and then he became a really powerful church leader. Like he, he became totally, totally converted. Now at this point, we're not sure exactly where he was, but the best guess is that James, along with Jesus' other family members, probably stayed in Jerusalem. That's likely where they were living. So our best assumption is that James was probably in Jerusalem or near Jerusalem with his family, also able to be by church leadership. That story seems to make sense. As for when he wrote this, very, very hard to date, but it's possible that he wrote this around 45, the year 45, which, fun fact, would actually make it possibly the earliest written book in the entire New Testament, because Paul didn't start writing until probably the year 50, um, and then even the Gospels were written after that, right? Kind of weird, I know, it's hard to wrap brains around. So it's possible James wrote this before anything else, or maybe not, we don't know. Now, what did he write? Why did he even write this letter? Um, he's a church leader, and so there is going to be some administrative advice in what he's giving, but for the most part, it is a spiritual sermon. In fact, a lot of scholars have noticed that the book of James refers a lot to elements in Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. And so a lot of scholars believe that James is almost like expounding on Jesus's very famous sermon on the mountain, on the mount, right? He's, he's saying, 
look, you know that Jesus said all this, and now I'm going to add some of my own thoughts in addition to this and other applications for it. It's like he's given a talk, and the Sermon on the Mount is the source material, and now James is adding his own thoughts. So as you go throughout James, it's not like he's quoting, although there are a few like exact phrases, um, but it's more so you'll be like, oh wait, I, this sounds very familiar. <laughs> this sounds like familiar advice that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. See if you can pull that out this week. That's a good little challenge to try and figure out. All right, that's it for all the context on James. Jesus' half-brother, big leader in the church, probably in Jerusalem, and now he's writing out a letter probably to expound on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now let's dive into the five chapters. What was Jesus actually, James, James, what was James teaching within these five chapters? He was expounding off of Jesus, right? I'm sure he would have said similar things. Um, okay, wait, wait, wait. I knew I was forgetting something. We can't skip talking about Joseph Smith. We've got to talk about Joseph Smith because James chapter one, verses five and six were the verses that inspired Joseph Smith to go and ask a very, very important question. In fact, some people, um, some LDS scholars have said that James 1, 5 is the most important verse in the entire New Testament. That having this whole book of the New Testament and then having eventually where Joseph Smith can read it and then seeing that exact piece of advice from James and then going out to ask his question that started the ball rolling for this entire restoration of the fullness of the gospel, that was the most important verse in the New Testament. So gotta look out for that as you read through James chapter one and you get to verses five and six. Definitely think about Joseph Smith and what this would have been like as he read that as well. Okay, now we'll go into it. I saw my notes for James 1. I'm like, wait, gotta talk about Joseph Smith. Okay, so what's the content within James chapter 1? It starts off with the very famous advice that if we lack wisdom, we should ask of God, and God will give us wisdom. He will answer our prayers. He will tell us the things that he knows we are ready to hear. James continues on to talk about how Riches will fade, but we are blessed if we endure, even if we are poor. Enduring is what gets, um, what earns us blessings. Every good gift comes from God. And don't just hear the word, do the word of God. We can't just listen. We've got to act. We've got to change. And that pure religion is visiting the fatherless and the widows. I love James. And a lot of famous verses in here too. I love it. Chapter two, there is a Joseph Smith translation in the appendix, one of the bigger ones at the end. So check that out. There's lots of Joseph Smith translations in the footnotes for all these chapters, but chapter two has an appendix one, one of the bigger ones. Um, James says, don't judge people based on their wealth because God often chooses the poor to be rich in faith. Basically, we can't expect that monetary blessings reflect in any sort of way someone's spiritual state. We can't have faith without good works, but our faith should show through our good works. We need both, and we manifest our faith as we do good works. Chapter 3, James starts off talking about tongues, meaning our words. He says, bridle your tongues. The tongue is a very powerful element. It can curse and it can bless. So speak wisely. Choose your words wisely when you're talking. Worldly wisdom leads to confusion, whereas wisdom from above is pure, and that leads to mercy and peace always seeking wisdom from the right sources. Chapter four, lusting and covetousness lead to wars and they lead to adultery. And anyone who is a friend of the world's is an enemy to God. If we draw nearer to God, God will draw nearer to us. Our afflictions are meant to humble us and bring us closer to God. And finally, chapter five, the misery that awaits the unrighteous rich in the next life will 
be because their unjust actions won't fade. Their riches will fade, but their unjust actions will still be there. Basically, our actions are what matters, not whether we are gaining riches in this world. James encourages everyone to be patient. If they are sick, they should call on the elders for a blessing. And he encourages them to convert the people around them, welcome them in, and that converting a sinner saves a soul. I love it. You're going to love reading James this week. It's a great one. Um, I think for my personal focus question, I often, I don't like doing the obvious thing. I like to be like, okay, that's obvious, but I have this maybe more obscure thing I'm thinking about. But I keep thinking about James 1, 5 as I was going through this. I kept coming back to that powerful piece of advice. So what I want to reflect on this week is what can I learn from how Joseph Smith took James's advice? To ask God a question. So I want to think, what is a question that's on my heart right now? First of all, am I asking God at all? Because sometimes I just feel like I have these questions and issues in my life, but I've never literally said them out loud in a prayer or even like in my mind. I've never put it together in a prayer. It's like, oh, I'm sure Heavenly Father knows all my issues, right? But I've never brought it to him in prayer. So sometimes there's a disconnect there. But even I want to look at what Joseph Smith did. He prayed with a sense of sacrifice and devotion. He did things to make that prayer special. He knew he needed an answer and he prepared and he chose a time of day and he went to a special place and he separated himself. Like the, this was work that he did in order to qualify himself for a powerful answer. So thinking about for my big questions, am I asking at all? And if I'm asking, how can I maybe be a little more serious or put a little more effort into the way that I'm asking? I hope that makes sense. I just think there's so much we can learn from how Joseph asked his question. Of course, God hears every question that we have, but I think when we kind of feel, this is a big one, this is a big one, and I really got this question on my mind, I think we can maybe put forth a little more effort to show God what we're willing to do, how desperate we are for an answer, and... The Lord loves effort, right? Okay, have a great week this week. Oh, by the way, our one minute scripture study in the Book of Mormon book, you guys sold it out of so many Costco's last weekend, but here's the good news. They have restocked this past weekend. So go and check your local Costco's. Um, this is only if you're in Utah and a few locations in Idaho and Arizona. You can check out my Instagram post if you wanna see the exact Costco locations. I'm so sorry we can't get it to everyone, but if you missed it last weekend, there are more copies available. Okay, have a great week and happy studying.